Hello, um, welcome everyone. I, we understand more people are joining, but we may as well kick off and welcome them as they join. Thank you all so much for joining the first of all of the Tech 23 Impact Circles. We're very excited to have this wonderful lineup, which you'll be hearing from shortly. Today, we're gonna to be talking around quantum powered industries. As is custom, first, I would like to acknowledge both the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Bunwarung and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation your traditional custodians of the land where the Slattery's team meets, works and creates. We pay our respects to the elders, both past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge that people are attending today from other traditional lands and nations, and we extend our respects to their custodians, ancestors, elders and future leaders. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Good afternoon, Rachel. Hello and hello to everyone. This is so exciting. I'm uh, incredibly excited to welcome uh, Michael, uh, Marcus, uh, Jane, very early start for Jane, and of course the wonderful Bill Barty uh, to kick us off on this wonderful uh, Tech 23 Impact Circle. Uh, the team at Slattery's have really been missing uh, the conversations and connections that we get from face-to-face -face events, and it's been wonderful to know we're not alone. Uh, so hence the conversations uh, kicking off. Uh, this is our chance, I suppose, to um, bring people together to convene and to connect. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that you get something um, really valuable out of today's uh, session. Uh, I want to um, also suggest that um, this is also a good time, you know, despite it being online, uh, the, one of the benefits is that people get to connect from wherever they might be. So Jane is actually coming to us. I think she wins today. She's coming to us from the UK, um, very early morning there. But it would be great if people can call out now actually on the, on the um, uh, chat and just say where you're Zooming in from. Uh, and I want to especially call out anyone that's coming in from Melbourne. Well done, Melbourne, Victoria. Um, congratulations. And uh, it's nice to have uh, that milestone yesterday uh, achieved. So well done. We have a number of circles coming up, um, up over the next couple of months. So I encourage you um, to register. Someone just mentioned that it's difficult. Um, please give us suggestions on how to make it easier. Um, we would be very grateful as we provide the circles over the next couple of months uh, to help people uh, connect on what are some of the great challenges uh, the world actually faces. Uh, the circles and how they run are really up to you. We, we encourage them to be very relaxed. Um, I feel so um, privileged to be eavesdropping on today's conversation. So I hope you too will really enjoy listening to the contributors today, have the opportunity to ask questions of them in the chat. We've also got a board that we will share where we suggest that you can also share your takeaways uh, with everyone. Uh, and so we can get the most out of this session. Uh, Adina, is there anything else that I've missed that we need to cover? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. You would have seen in your reminder today and just dropping in the Zoom chat now, I hope I'm pointing in the right direction, um, there will be a link to the Slattery's Community Charter, which is a great read if you need some guidance on the behaviour that's encouraged at all of our circles and events indeed. Just to confirm, the running order today will be starting off with Bill and the contributors kicking off a lively conversation, followed by any Q&A that you're welcome to pop into the chat or put your hand up and ask questions straight off the bat. Um, and then finishing with some randomised deep dive breakout rooms during which we will chat a little bit further um, across the topics. Um, now we are using a shared mural board to capture your thoughts and squiggles. So anyone who's artistically inclined or otherwise, you're welcome to add all of your drawings or notes on there. Um, please feel free to add whatever you like. Um, questions again, chat function in Zoom or put up your hand. Just so you know, we will be recording this presentation and we'll make it available post-event so you can revisit later on. As Rachel mentioned, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to every one of the Circle contributors and Bill for leading today and the team at Mate Sequence for helping make it all happen and come into being. Thank you very much also to everyone who's dialed in. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bill to kick things off. Hi, Bill. Oh, hi. Well, hello, everybody. So thanks very much for attending today. So I think um, what we want to do today is just have a conversation in and around the 
that quantum computing, quantum sensing, and quantum communications. There's been a lot of things written, uh, both uh, incorrectly and correctly, about this entire area. And we're lucky enough to have uh, three industry leaders today uh, with us to help everybody sort of understand this whole segment. Um, Australia has sort of a golden chance to really become a leader worldwide in this entire area. And we wanna make sure that we take advantage of that. And part of that is to make sure that there's enough conversation among in industry participants and people who have an interest in the area to, to make it happen. So today we've got um, uh, Jane Garrett and Jane runs the uh, Quantum Technology Enterprise Center from Bristol University. Uh, she's with us today and she's worked with the University of Bristol a lot of folks over in England to grow their particular industry. We also have uh, Mike Biersuk. Mike is a professor of physics at the University of Sydney and the, the uh, CEO and founder of uh, QControl, which uh, makes control software for quantum computing and sensing. Uh, we are an investor in QControl. Uh, also, we have uh, Marcus Doherty. Marcus is a professor at ANU, and Marcus uh, is a uh, co-founder of a company called Quantum Brilliance, which makes a, a computer a quantum computer that works at room temperature. He also has a role in the in the army and is leading the um, the effort for the army and its uh, whole strategy in and around the quantum area. So we've got a lot of uh, good experts here. I also note that uh, I think on the attendance list we've got Andrew Zurak, who's a professor of physics over at UNSW. I think uh, we might have Peter Turner, who is the CEO of something called Silicon uh, Quantum Academy and maybe John King as well, who I think is the COO of Silicon Quantum Computing. So we've got a lot of expertise on the line today. And um, so this is, an, this is an opportunity to get to know a little bit about the industry, a little bit about the players in the industry and, and what this whole thing is about. Um, what I'm gonna do is, um, is share a couple of slides very quickly and then we'll, we'll get to, uh, to Mike and Jane and Marcus, uh, who've got uh, the real power in the room in, in terms of knowledge, uh, and and start. But let me see if I can work this uh, work this thing here. And uh, hold on just a second, and I'll show you a couple of things. Okay, so this is nothing more than a um, just an illustration of some of the uh, a tip of the iceberg of, of some of the companies that are working in this particular area. And what, what this illustrates is this illustrates that this is a real industry. So at the top, you see this top layer, and these are some of the countries that are, are, have declared that quantum computing, quantum sensing, and the whole quantum industry is something that they want to uh, lead in. So it's happening in a big way. You also see in the second slice, some of the larger companies that are, that are participants, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, IBM, Toshiba, Alibaba, D-Wave, et cetera. Uh, and uh, in the middle there, you see a number of startups and you can see Quantum Brilliance and Q-Control who are in that particular area. And then at the bottom, there's some of the universities that are, that are participants as well. And what you have here is you have a real small snapshot of some of the, some of the participants around the world. But I can tell you that there's hundreds of billions of dollars that are sort of going into this into this industry right now, and it is it is a real one. It's not just focused on research. There's lots happening right now. Uh, CSIRO did a, uh, a sort of a roadmap of uh, where uh, the quantum computer industry sits and where the quantum sensing and communications industry sits uh, in in Australia. And what they found is that look, um, we've got 22 institutions. We've got eight universities that are highly committed to this particular area and two quantum focused centers of excellence. So there's lots of intellectual power here and, and lots, of, lots of ability. Uh, and, and as I said, this sort of forms the basis for the opportunity to, to lead the world in, in quantum and quantum industries. And where that can lead to essentially for Australia is that it can lead to essentially $4 billion in revenue uh, composed really in, in sort of three sectors in the in quantum technology. One is in quantum computing, which we hear about most often. What you don't hear about very often is quantum sensing and quantum communications. Uh, so there is an opportunity here really to, to build a pretty large industry. And what I wanted to do is maybe hand it to, um, uh, to Mike uh, Biersuk, uh, just to have a, a, a quick, um, discussion about about why is it that 
that there is so much talent here and um, how, you know, how does it, um, how did we get here, Mike? And, and what? Well, all right, thanks, Bill. Um, so maybe you just give us a, a quick upper, a quick background and, and tell us a little bit about Q Control too. Sure, thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I, I think the the first thing I wanted to say is if you look at that CSIRO roadmap, it's a it's a great demonstration of uh, you know a solid analysis about what's possible, but it's exceptionally conservative. That four billion dollar revenue number is uh, it's not that's not at the scale at which our ambitions lie. And it's, uh, I think, uh, based on a pretty conservative perspective on how much value capture Australia uh, will take from that, I think there is much, much bigger opportunity. Now, in terms of uh, background and how we got to where we are, this is a field where, where there's really been a huge amount of research activity, uh, largely in the academic sector, for the last, say, 25 years. Um, there was a very strong history of uh, academic science in fields that came before the name of quantum technology or before we started talking about fields like quantum computing or quantum information. Fields like condensed matter physics, fields like atomic physics, fields like optical physics, fields where we saw uh, an emergence of activity just at the right time for some of the big developments in the field. In the mid-1990s, a gentleman named Peter Shore wrote down an algorithm that effectively said, if you can build a machine that obeys the rules of quantum, of quantum physics for computing, then you may be able to solve a problem that is extremely important for information security. It's, it's the mathematical problem that gives us all online security. It's behind RSA and all these other encryption protocols, public key encryption protocols. Immediately after that, the National Security Agency in the United States launched its first ever open university research program, engaging the whole global community to ask the question whether a machine like this could actually be built. And at the time, this is now the, the mid to late 1990s, um, a gentleman at UNSW, Bob Clark, uh, deserves a lot of credit for being visionary and bringing together the experts from these various fields, from condensed matter, from optical physics, from uh, atomic physics, and saying, we think we have ways that we can actually start to build these machines. From there, Australia became a key player in what was at the time the leading academic research program in the world. And it actually remains that way today. Now, uh, I am the, you know, the first generation to grow up as an academic entirely in the field of quantum computing, right? I'm the, you know, the, the, the son, I guess, of people who were real pioneers in, in the development of this field. And uh, uh, as you can perhaps hear from my accent, I am, uh, I'm American, but I moved to Australia because of the strength of the research community. Now, just in the last few years, since uh, about 2017, we've seen that there was an opportunity for translation of that fundamental foundational academic research into new industry opportunities, into building new companies. And that's what we've started with Q-Control. But all of it is predicated on the fact that there is this enormous talent base that draws people from all over the world. At the University of Sydney, there are like six or seven faculty members in, in quantum information, and only one of them is actually Australian. The rest are all immigrants to Australia. And so that sets the stage and you'll see the same story at, uh, at all the other uh, top academic locations uh, across Australia, but that's the basis for where we are today in building this new industry on top of such extraordinary research strength. Yeah, that's, that's great, Mike. And, and you know, one of the, th one of the things that, um, that you can see when you look around the various academic institutions is that each, each University has uh, a number of different strengths, and I know at A and U, for instance, there's a lot of strength in in diamond, uh, a lot of strength in photonics and lasers, and and Marcus, uh, you lead a number a, a lot of that, and you're also a co-founder of this company called Quantum Brilliance. So, can you just sort of give us a, a quick snapshot of what you do, what your expertise is, and also what are you what are you doing for the Army as well? Because there's there's quite a bit you're doing there. Sure, thanks, Bill. My my absolute pleasure to do so. And um, it's my pleasure to be here and be able to contribute to this discussion today. Um, so ANU is quite a rich and diverse place when it comes to quantum technology. We have everything from precision quantum sensors who measure gravity, which enable you to discover things underneath the Earth's surface, 
uh, quantum memories that will allow uh, global quantum communications and then right through to diamond quantum computing. Uh, at the ANU, I, I lead a, a laboratory where we develop uh, quantum sensors, microscopes and computers using the extreme properties of diamond. Um, a number of years ago, we worked very particular on a major blocker to solving how to scale up diamond quantum computing at room temperature. Uh, and we converted that technology now into our spin out called Quantum Brilliance. Quantum Brilliance is a company whose aim is to build a quantum microprocessor. So it's a very different vision for what quantum computing is. Unlike mainframe systems, such as the ones being produced by IBM and Google, which form a particular role, they do a particular role, we want to build the quantum accelerator cards, which are the size of lunchboxes, which you slot into computing systems wherever you find computing systems today. And they accelerate and they add something to those computer systems that enable you to do dramatically new tasks. And I can talk about what those tasks are, are later. Uh, in the Army, I, I work in the uh, Future Land Warfare branch of Army Headquarters. And we set about a task this year, primarily driven in response by the CSIRO roadmap, to build our own Army quantum technology roadmap. And that is currently going through a process of internal review and will hopefully be released soon. Alongside of it, a suite of, uh, of, of programs and challenges and these sorts of things to build an innovation community that focuses on discovering applications and applying quantum technology in the land domain of warfare. Um, that is forced Army to think big about how does it engage in a technology of a, uh, an emerging industry uh, and how does it build that community and understand how to engage and support the growth of that industry um, so that it can do that technology delivery and uh, development and deliver on those applications to Army. Uh, Bill, back over to you. Yeah, great. And, and Jane, I know that um, you uh, head, up, uh, head up the the Quantum Technology Enterprise Center for University of Bristol. So what, what is that? Uh, and, and what do you do and, and how have you, I know you've managed to put together a lot of collaborations between different fields and different areas, but, but if you could describe what you do and what you've found that works and, and uh, is helpful in this, in the building of the whole quantum industry over in, uh, over in Europe, that would be great. Oh, no, and thanks everyone for inviting me. It's uh, 20 past five. And um, please excuse any strange noises that come from here. My Labrador has joined me and he's wondering what on earth I'm doing up at this hour. So I apologize if there's any strange noise. Um, okay, so QTech, um, the UK government, as you might know, set up a quantum program and they put 270 million sterling behind it and set up four quantum hub, hubs, which were research hubs at universities across the UK. So you've got quantum computing at the University of Oxford, you've got sensors and metrology at Birmingham, the quantum communications hub at York, and then there's enhanced imaging at Glasgow. So they were set up to research, they now have a remit to be entrepreneurial, but at the time of setting up, those hubs, the government decided to set up a skills and training hub for the commercialization of quantum. And so QTech at the University of Bristol was awarded 4.4 million sterling for a period of five years in order to take quantum out of the lab and into the market. And so that's essentially what we've done. And I think one of the reasons I'm here today is that the funding for QTech in the UK is coming to an end at the end of March, and that leaves a worldwide opportunity for somebody to step in and take over that commercialization of quantum technologies. So what we did was to set up a year-long teaching program, and essentially the people that were recruited into it were at postdoc level, and they generally had some research that they wanted to commercialize. And we took them through a series of business teaching, generally at about MBA level, got them to business plan in six months, investor ready at nine months, and ideally funded by 12 months. But it was a learning process. And in actual fact, the funding took about one and a half years before they were actually in funded startups. And we were incredibly successful. And we've created um, 
41 companies, 24 of which have actually gone on and either got revenue or grant funding. And in total, they've achieved over 40 million sterling in grant equity and revenue collectively. And uh, so we've created companies in all aspects of quantum. So you were talking about quantum computing. Well, only one of ours is actually headed into the quantum computing market, which is a company called Seek, which is a spin out of a US company called Hyperus. But we've created companies like Floretic, which is doing fast bacteria identification. Another one called QLM, which is doing detection of low concentrations of methane. We've got Keps Quantum Security, New Quantum, and we've got some in process at the moment. And there's a company called Quantum Dice that's come out from the University of Oxford. The program has been open to anybody from all over the world. So before COVID, people used to come to Bristol. We had one guy come from Melbourne. He discovered that his tech wasn't going to work. So he joined one of the other startups that we created. So it's been hugely successful, immense fun. And it will be lovely to see a program similar to QTech starting up somewhere else in the world. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that's great, Jane. I think one of the things that, you know, one, one of the things that, that people um, who are new to the industry don't see all the time is they don't see all the layers of, of the quantum technology industry. So there's been lots of things written about quantum computing, whatever that is, right? Uh, but there's a, there's a whole uh, group of other applications in other areas. So it, you know, at main sequence, what we sort of do is we, we think of it in kind of three different areas. We think that there's, you know, there's an area of work in, in quantum computing. And when we get to the point where we have a useful quantum computer, useful quantum computers will be able to do lots of things that, that other classical computers can't do, especially around optimization and probabilities and, and, and things of that nature. So there's a certain class of problems that, that quantum computers will be able to, um, to do much better than, than other types of classical computers. There's also a, an area called quantum sensing and quantum, Im quantum imaging, and that's where you are able to make sensors that are a lot finer uh, and, and you can improve imaging quite substantially. Uh, and there's also uh, quantum communications and, and quantum cryptography. So this is not an industry where there is a whole, where, where this is an industry, this is not an industry that is not here now. Or a better way to say that is we are, we do have an industry now and it is building and building over time. Probably the last thing to come will be a logical quantum computer uh, down the road. But in the meantime, we've got something called these noisy quantum computers. And you probably all heard of, of something that Google did um, about, I don't know, eight months ago now called uh, Quantum Advantage. But it, it might help to um, uh, just uh, to go back to Mike and Marcus and Jane to you know, talk about quantum sensing. Uh, and Mike, tell, tell everybody what Q Control does as well, because you, you play an integral part in the entire quantum stack, which is important to understand. Uh, he makes makes these things useful, but help the audience understand you know the opportunities in quantum sensing, imaging, and comms and cryptography, if you could, so that we can we can uh, make sure everybody understands that. Uh, there's a lot to cover there. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe the the let me correct something you said, if you don't mind, so yeah. the audience doesn't get the wrong idea. What Google did was called quantum supremacy, not supremacy. quantum advantage. It's a, it, it is a technical distinction that's very important for our discussion a little bit later. Yeah. Um, but for now, for now, here's the key message. Quantum physics is now being used as a resource. And we think that quantum technology, which uses quantum physics as a resource, is likely to be as transformational in the 21st century as harnessing electricity as a resource was in the 19th. And of course, that means that there are many different verticals that are impacted by this. One of the first, based on that early research I mentioned before from Peter Shore uh, in quantum, uh, quantum computing, is the idea of processing information with quantum physics. Now that leads to new kinds of computers that solve problems that are either practically or actually impossible for conventional machines. The application space there ranges from information security, uh, which is a longer term ambition, to nearer term problems in agricultural technology, uh, clean energy, synthesis and generation and distribution even, and 
chemistry, pharmaceutical industry, and related technologies. Then you have other verticals. So say defense and aerospace, where uh, there's already a very well-established sensing uh, market. So this is remote detection of either underground targets or uh, remote detection of some uh, aircraft. I mean, radar is an example of standoff detection, right? It's just conventional radar technology that we're talking about. But there are all sorts of other things that one can do if one uses quantum enhanced sensors. So for instance, one can make very sensitive detectors of gravity. And if you can make sen sensitive detectors of gravity, you can detect underground structures like uh, urban infrastructure, or you can detect changes in aquifer levels if you're interested in agriculture. Uh, the idea with quantum sensing is by having a much, much more sensitive detector, you can either measure things that were previously too small to detect, or you can measure the same thing much, much faster. That's a, an important trade-off in this field. And measuring something much faster allows you to do broader surveys, to do uh, uh, wider area surveys and the like. Now, quantum sensing is a very high growth area of activity. We have a lot of activity in this. I'll come to Q control specifically in a moment. But then that last bit is quantum communications, using the physics of quantum mechanics in order to provide security against eavesdropping in uh, in telecommunications. Now, this is an area where you hear uh, names like quantum key distribution, uh, where we think we can make um, crypto systems that exploit quantum physics for information security. Uh, it, it's still a, an emerging area of activity, but there are commercial entities there as well. Now, across all of these, across all of these different verticals, there are massive challenges in making quantum technologies actually work. And this is because the underlying hardware is very fragile. What we experience in our daily lives is not consistent with the rules of quantum mechanics. We're con our, our experience is consistent with the rules of classical physics. And we see this breakdown from very, very small things like individual atoms that are used in these devices to the macro scale where we exist. That breakdown, that loss of quantumness is endemic to all of these technologies. And in point of fact, dealing with instability in quantum hardware is the fundamental challenge. It is the Achilles heel. It's not easy to just make quantum computers. They're extremely fragile, extremely delicate, and they just fail very, very rapidly. Q-Control's focus and expertise is in an area called quantum control engineering. Control engineering uh, writ large is the discipline that makes all of our technology work. It makes walking robots, it makes airplanes fly, it makes drone technology. Our expertise is in applying this discipline of engineering to systems that obey the rules of quantum physics with a key objective of extracting useful work, whether that's improving the stability of hardware to do bigger, harder, longer computations, or it's making sensors where we can get more useful information out of the sensors. All of that comes through uh, our efforts in quantum control. Now, I wanted to, to take a step back because we heard a little bit from, from me, from Marcus uh, and from Jane about the role that academia and government programs have played. I do think it's really important that the audience gets a message that this is not like you know academics playing dress up. This is a real industry. And uh, indeed there are uh, accelerators and incubators that exist uh, in the university sector. But Q-Control for instance is backed by Sequoia Capital, right? And, and Data Collective and Horizons Ventures out of Hong Kong. Uh, the, there are many, many real uh, global scale investors that are engaged in this. It's not just university incubator programs. I think it's a really important distinction and it speaks to the level of impact that this field could have across all of these different verticals. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really good point because this is an industry that that is growing and it's growing very quickly. And what, what we are seeing increasingly is we're seeing enterprises and large companies engage with the quantum industry. So for instance, locally, you know, uh, Commonwealth Bank has uh, has a team that uh, is engaged in and around the quantum area, and for them, they want to understand a couple things. They want to understand how does it affect my communications, how does it affect my security, how does it affect how does it enable me to improve and optimize uh, client portfolios. So these are sort of three key things, and even though we may not have a quantum computer that can actually sort of crack the security codes of RSA today for a while, what's important is that there is thinking about that that needs to go on now in order to sort of future-proof these ideas. And Marcus, let me just hand it over to you and get some of those ideas. You know, if you could pick up on some of that conversation, talk about some of the things that 
you're working on. Because I know you have some collaborations with uh, some of the supercomputer centers around the world. If so, if you could talk about you know what you see as the real applications that are happening now and some of the collaborations that you're working on currently, uh, that would be useful, I think, to the audience. Thanks, Bill. Absolutely. So. I'll lead in with what the challenge is. The challenge is, so what does a quantum computer do? A quantum computer solves a problem in one second that would take a classical computer days or years or forever to solve. So what that means is a quantum computer makes some problems tractable for the first time. It makes them solvable for the first time. The wrong conception to have is that a quantum computer makes something a bit faster. That's not what a quantum computer does. An alternative way of thinking about a quantum computer is that given a certain amount of time, a quantum computer makes an existing calculation a lot more accurate. So it improves the accuracy of, of, a, of a particular result far beyond what is possible with a classical computer. So both of those two ways of thinking mean that when you are thinking about quantum computing, they mean you have to change your workflow about how you're designing your technology, building your technology and exploiting computing resources. So as a result, there is a transformation that needs to happen to be able to exploit the fact that problems all of a sudden that were previously unsolvable are now solvable. And you can work out how to use that new opportunity to improve what you're doing. So, I'll talk to three different ways um, about how to undergo that transformation process and how Quantum Brilliance is offering products and services to facilitate that transformation process. And then I'll also talk um, just briefly about how ARMY sees that and ARMY's approach to uh, its proposed proposed approach to dealing with that transformation and finding an efficient route to identifying uh, those most disruptive applications and then employing them uh, in the future. So at Quantum Brilliance, we have a couple of different things on the boil. So one is an application discovery process that we take companies through. Another thing is we're a partner in the Quantum Innovation Hub at the Pawsey Supercomputing Center. And the reason why we're a partner there is because in order to take you all the way through this application discovery, and then develop applications and demonstrate those applications, there's a role for high performance computing in delivering that ultimate end, which is we know how to solve your problem and we know exactly when we'll be able to solve it with the advent of this particular hardware in the future. And there's requirement of high performance computing to support that demonstration process. So that's why we're a partner with the uh, Quantum Innovation Hub at Pawsey. So I'll talk a little bit about what that application discovery and development um, process is like so people can get a real feel for it. So it begins with a conversation, which is around what is a person's business? What are they actually trying to solve? And what are their computing constraints? So that's about improving what they currently do at the moment. Then there's another element to it, which is what if you could solve this thing now instead of working around it and trying to find another way to obtain what you're trying to do what if you could solve this problem head on or you could solve these constellation of problems which dramatically changes how you do things so that's the second conversation to have and once we go through that initial consultation then there's a process of doing a technical specification around what are those problems where the com computing constraints uh, are, are greatest felt and what are those greatest opportunities on, on the flip side as well? And then from there, we go away and we, uh, we, we search, we identify, we build various options that could potentially deliver advantage uh, against those, uh, those constraints and opportunities. And then through a, a, a consultation process, develop an application and prove that application and assess when will it deliver advantage? What are the specific requirements on hardware? So that's a process that Quantum Brilliance is doing. And to support that consulting process, we have various products. One is uh, a quantum emulator, which behaves and functions like our quantum hardware and enables us to project into the near future about how our hardware will perform. And the other part is our quantum hardware that uh, we can sell to you and you can take delivery of it and you can have it on your desk and you can run. Uh, and it's a few qubit 
uh, quantum uh, uh, development kit, which enables you to experience the intricacies of the quantum hardware, but it also allows you to go on a co-development journey. It means that you can test and adjust the resources on that development kit and work with us to develop the hardware in a way that will meet your ultimate solution that you're working for. So that is how Quantum Brilliance is engaging with companies right now and developing solutions uh, and interacting with a transformation hub, being this innovation hub at Pawsey. So I'll pause there and, and I'll change my hat and I'll talk about um, Army and Army's thoughts about how to approach this problem. So Army's premise is that the most disruptive applications of quantum technologies have not yet been discovered and they have not yet been developed. There is many very important applications, but we still think that the really the big ones which really influence defense and how it operates are still coming. So our approach to this is to um, work very hard to develop an innovation community of Australian industry, uh, as well as Australian research, as well as our global allies and their research and development and industry bases as well. Uh, and having developed this community, then go through a process of hypothesizing certain applications in land warfare and challenging that community to deliver against those applications. Uh, and part of that is then to very rapidly sift through multiple options until we find certain applications which are likely to, to deliver the highest value. At that point, there is it then switches into an idea of how do we support the development of that technology so that it can deliver on its aspirations and the value of that, that application that we have discovered with that partner. And that then comes into, okay, if it's a dual use technology, what is Army's role in supporting that company build and grow and develop that technology whilst playing in, in both playing in the civilian space as well as playing with us in the military space? Um, so with, with that, Bill, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I'm just looking at this, um, looking at the mural board. So if anybody has questions, uh, we'll, we'll, we can take these questions live or you can add them to the mural board, which is in the chat section. But there is an interesting question on the mural board, which which I'll open it for, for everybody, which says that um, this person is interested in quantum imaging. What impact does this have in sort of transform, transforming current clinical diagnosis capability? In other words, what, what effect does quantum technologies have on you know, potential MRI machines and, and, and things like that? Can we offer some thoughts there and what, how transformative that could be? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, Q-Control has a whole practice in new kinds of medical imaging that derive insight from quantum technology. Now, the, the really interesting thing is that a lot of what we do in, in quantum computing and quantum sensing now is actually built on knowledge that comes from medical imaging, that comes from the field of magnetic resonance that makes MRI work. Um, now it's become a bit of a feedback loop that we can develop totally new kinds of imaging that are uh, leveraging, for instance, new developments in quantum control that come from, say, our team and, uh, and change the way that we can detect disease. So there's a, there's a great example that goes back uh, 11 years, I think, in my, uh, in my academic career, where uh, I did some work in quantum control where we learn to make quantum bits, the fundamental information carriers in, an, in a quantum computer more stable, to make them live longer before they degraded. Um, a, a professor in the US uh, who worked in magnetic resonance imaging saw this and picked it up and used this similar technique in uh, contrast weighted MRI to find that he could detect new morphologies that were not otherwise available, not otherwise accessible in uh, whole animal imaging. And so it's a great example of how uh, the new developments that are coming in quantum computing technology actually feed back via this, you know, our focus on quantum control to new kinds of diagnostics uh, for uh, disease, morphology, and the like. So uh, if anybody's interested in that, please uh, contact me afterwards. But I think, um, you know, quantum sensing much more broadly is uh, a really high impact area where there are a huge number of uh, new insights coming from research going on in academic teams, as well as in industry right now, delivering fundamentally new capabilities. So, so Mark, I, I might add to that as well. So 
Um, there's a couple of angles I'd like to take on it. So in it, something that is, is, is very close uh, is uh, there is a variety of country, uh, companies around the world who are delivering, uh, developing means to increase the polarization of magnetic dyes that are used in MRI imaging. And by increasing that polarization of those magnetic dyes, you get a much higher contrast MRI image, which allows you to uh, identify and, and diagnose different types of things uh, much better than if you had a much lower contrast in those, those images. Uh, a second thing is building upon Mike's um, as, uh, very true statements that a lot of quantum sensing grew from the very, very mature techniques used in magnetic resonance is a concept called uh, chip scale chemical analysis. So there is, um, there is a, a group in the University of Melbourne who are on the precipice of translating a technology where they do chip scale nuclear magnetic resonance. Now nuclear magnetic resonance is the gold standard in chemical analysis. It is what chemists go to in order to work out precisely the chemical composition of a sample. The trouble with nuclear magnetic resonance, the very precise form of it, is it occupies a whole room and it consumes a great deal of cryogenics and it's a sort of complicated piece of equipment. With quantum sensors, you can take that same sensitivity that that room size thing and you can shrink it to the size of a chip. And so this now democratizes the capability of doing precision chemical analysis in medical sciences and medical uh, uh, pathology in these types of applications, as well as in chemical processes in chemical engineering. Um, to weave quantum computing into the story, um, one, of our, one, of, one of the corporations that we have spoken to, uh, when they are working in medical imaging, uh, they are severely constrained by the computing resources that they have in the suite in order to do things like process MRI images and process, process CT scans and these sorts of things. There's an issue that they can't use cloud resources because of latency issues as well as privacy issues. And so with improved computing resources in suite, they can improve the resolution and the quality of those images. Uh, and so that is an application which naturally resonates with quantum computing, where some of the, some of the most advantageous uh, algorithms, et cetera, are in image and signal processing. Um, uh, that's me done, Bill. Okay, great. Jane, did you have something? Very, just very quickly. Um, two of the companies that we've created are actually using sensing and imaging. But the way I look at this, and forgive me, my physics degree was a very, very long time ago. Quantum is the enabler in these um, solutions which create better solutions for the market. So what we're using is a quantum technology to create a solution that is better than that which is on the market at the moment. So if you take fluoretic, it can identify bacteria in 15 minutes, whereas we know at the moment in urine samples, they're sent off for uh, testing, take two or three days before there's results. So you can actually get result by bedside, but you still have to go through the regulation. So whilst we're getting to the point where quantum can provide some quick results and better, and, um, better technology than we're using at the moment, we still have that process we have to go through. So whilst you're taking, when you're taking the technology out to the marketplace. So I just thought I'd throw that in because I was sat on a panel about a year ago. We were talking about quantum market and quantum very much is there, but these, the technology actually fits within other markets which we're identifying. So Floretic is MedTech, QLM we're seeing is sitting in the clean tech market. So quantum plays in these markets as well. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a good point. I mean, there, you, know, you, you can't think of, 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 of quantum technologies uh, in and of themselves as alone. They enable other things to happen. So there's all kinds of applications in chemistry, uh, drug development, and, and other potential things. But I, I think you said something else that's interesting there, Jane, and that is, and there's also a couple of questions on the board. And that is that, um, you know, that, one of the questions is, have any government or public bodies done much work on regulatory change needed to properly govern the use of quantum tech? So this is an area that's, uh, that I think needs to have some work done on it. Uh, but um, look, you know, you can, this is such a transformative 
potentially transformative industry in, in a lot of ways that naturally there may be, you know, it may be looked at uh, carefully. So what are the, what are the challenges, uh, Marcus and Mike, uh, from, a, from a regulatory point of view that we have to make sure that we have the right balance on here? Because one of, the thing, one of the things we don't want to do is strangle the industry. This is, this is such an important question. Um, unfortunately, uh, right now, th there is a lot of activity around policy and regulation in this field, um, but it is horribly ill-informed. We're making policy in government based on media, media, media release releases from both advocate nations and from uh, corporates, right? Guess what? When you, when you write a press release as a corporate, you sing the best possible story for yourself, but it's not necessarily the truth. <laughs> it's the best story, right? It's marketing. And we're making policy based on marketing. And it's because this is a really difficult field to understand. And so, you know, I, I've actually written two primers in national security journals about what is required to understand it in terms of the basics uh, to get into this field and to make policy from a reality-based perspective, from an evidence-based perspective. So, so where do we start? The, the start is, yes, the, the field can be really transformational. But in many cases, as exactly as Jane said, it will plug into existing regulated industries. And so if it's an enabler in something that's already regulated, does it need new regulation because there's a quantum word in there? No, probably not. When it comes to quantum computing, do we need a totally new approach to regulation? because it says quantum before computing? In my view, probably not. We need to regulate computing technology based on the capabilities unlocked by the ultimate hardware. And so right now, I think we have a, a key exercise that's required in which we must educate policymakers about what is real and what is not. The best example of how this runs away and gets you know, in exactly the wrong direction is based on something called quantum radar. It may be people in the, in the audience have heard about quantum radar. Um, there was a theoretical proposal you know, roughly 10 years ago. Then uh, in China, there were a couple of uh, claims in state media that the Chinese government had invented quantum radars that would defeat stealth technology, right? But then the academic literature continued to follow it for the last four or five years to the point that the originator of the field, the guy who wrote the first paper about it, published a whole bunch of papers saying this is actually totally impossible, right? It will never deliver what we hoped it might have for all of the following technical reasons. But that didn't stop a whole bunch of policymakers from trying to you know, get ahead of quantum radar, but it was not reality-based, it was marketing-based. And so uh, we have this, this really difficult tension between trying to excite uh, government about what's going on in this field, because we want them to be customers. We want them to be engaged in our industry. We want them to be supporters as well in some cases, but then we want them when it comes to making uh, policy to do so based on what is real in a very challenging field. Yep. Um, thanks, Mark. And um, so I, I could add a few comments to that as well. So Mark touched on being able to make policy that is based upon reality um, and being able, as a result, being able to support the technology and industry as it grows. Um, so it can deliver those ultimate things. And so if we just step back a one and let's think about what the strategic dilemma that Australia faces. So Australia faces the dilemma of, it has this uh, exceptional uh, research strength and, and this emergent industry, which is, which is coming as a result of that research strength. And this is unusual for Australia to have, but yet Australia doesn't have the, uh, the domestic markets, the domestic capital to fully develop that technology to realize its ultimate possibilities. Uh, and that includes developing so defense can realize the ultimate possibility and to develop uh, uh, solely through domestic means, a sovereign capability that delivers defense advantage. So Australia needs to be smart. It needs to be able to appropriately enable Australian industry to access foreign markets and foreign investment and these sorts of things. So we can grow, the technology can get to the point where it delivers defense advantage. Uh, and so there needs to be a very careful treatment here to allow it to grow and then but very accurately and precisely put in protections at the point at which 
Uh, we do not want that technology to go overseas into, into the wrong hand or to be influenced by the wrong hand. So it's all about precision uh, around this and how it's handled uh, in defence. So these are my personal views. Uh, they're not, they don't represent defence as a whole. This is what I particularly think about this um, and, and certainly what I recommend to my peers. Um, Bill, over to you. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the point here is that, you know, when you have a transformational technology like this, where we do have a chance to really lead the world and really big, build a big industry here, that we've got to think carefully about it. And one of the things that we, that probably thing is to hold on this by not allowing others to invest in the field when there is no danger. So the risk we run if we don't, uh, if we do it too soon is we strangle all the, you know, the capital from our, our you know, like-minded venture firms in the US and elsewhere who might want to invest in some of these companies and some of these ideas that are coming out of this particular strength of the, of the country. And if we, if we put blockers on that, then we're, then we're gonna uh, have a chilling effect on things. And so that's, um, you know, we gotta make sure that um, at least those who write the policies are informed of what's real and what's not so that they can uh, craft these things appropriately. Uh, so I think, um, I think that that's, uh, that's something that uh, is being talked about right now in proposed legislation and, and anything that we can do to make sure that um, people understand this from, from the real experts, I think, is, I think is a good thing. So I was, I was actually hoping to hear from, from Jane on what the UK experience has been like. I mean, the UK market is much, much bigger than, the, yeah. than Australia. Australia is having this dilemma, as Marcus suggested, of uh, trying to close things down, perhaps prematurely to have sovereign capability, but it's, it's you know, the tiniest of uh, economies and tiniest of populations. The UK is much bigger and has more experience. Jane, what has gone on there? Yeah, sure. No, thanks, Mike. And I was going to come in after your comment about the accelerator, because the way we worked, was we actually funded the person, we gave them a salary for a year, and then a very small stipend to get the, the business off the ground. Um, so they had to go out and find capital. And in the first year, we started 2016. So they were out looking for capital 2017. And most of the best investors were looking and say, what is this quantum thing? So there was a need to educate the investors. But what really helped at that very early stage was Innovate UK, which is the um, funding government body that puts, I think Marcus knows about them. They, they will put into a project, which at that stage could be led by a startup. 70% of the funding that was required to see that project through to its end, which meant the startup was looking for only 30% of the funding. And that completely de-risked it for the investor. And that's what really kick-started the investment that came into the first QTech companies. We had four out in the first year, so four out of four. And it was purely, I believe, due to this Innovate um, initiative. That has since stopped. And we've built relationships with as many investors as we possibly can that will look at quantum. Um, they are beginning to open up. Um, there's a group called Cambridge Angels, which naturally come from Cambridge. Um, they're sophisticated tech investors. And it's only, they actually came to us about six months ago and said, come and tell us about quantum. Why should we, we be investing in it? And they have now started to invest. So our final cohort of businesses that have been developed, they've started to look at, and we've actually had one invested in and one's in discussion at the moment. So it's coming, but it's really hard. Um, there's one company that has gone to Series A. They raised from Blue Yard initially in their first round, German company, and they raised their second round from Merck. So, but they are actually a US parent. So they've got access to the US investors. Mm -hmm. And that is just so, so important because from my looking at what's happening in Australia, you've got a lot of early stage or not a lot, but there is some early stage funding. Um, but to come up to series A, series B, the larger amounts, you have to look abroad. And if there's going to be regulation put on the investment coming into Australia, that will completely strangle any startup community. 
Yep. Great. I, think, I mean, I, maybe that feeds into, there's a question on the board bill. Why should we invest in quantum? Love a curious investor. Yeah. Now, may, I, I guess that's not you. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm pretty curious. <laughs> I, maybe maybe well, I wanted to take a, a stab yeah, at this, but I'd love to it. hear from, from our fellow panelists. Why should we invest in quantum? Uh, because almost every vertical that quantum is poised to revolutionize is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And there are so many slices that uh, exist, whether you're trying to build quantum hardware um, or you're building the key enabling software that uh, that Q-Control does that fits into all of these. We have revenue models that are based on you know tried and true things like SaaS with added capabilities like uh, revenue share from uh, cloud services. I mean, one of the ways that we work is uh, IBM, for instance, has uh, uh, this thing called the Q Startup Network. Uh, they provide access to their quantum computing hardware via the cloud. Uh, Q Control has the world's largest team of quantum control engineers, and we are the most experienced in performance optimization of any quantum computers anywhere. We have more than two billion. We have two billion uh, executions on uh, IBM hardware. We make the hardware perform better, right? And then we uh, both sell to the hardware manufacturers our capabilities, and we sell to end users. There are a ton of people and a ton of organizations that employ high performance computing now and if you oh, and cloud computing now and quantum computing can be just a, a, a new part of that community but then there are all these other completely new things like uh, quantum enhanced precision navigation where we have a commercial partnership with advanced navigation to help them develop quantum enhanced uh, uh, accelerometers that uh, uh, allow long endurance space and undersea missions uh, where now we're getting into defense uh, security applications, aerospace, um, and uh, there are giant plays when it comes to data acquisition, if we're talking about satellite-based sensing. I mean, there's, there are so many opportunities that are unlocked by new kinds of computing and new kinds of remote detection that, uh, you know, why wouldn't you want to be involved in the companies that are leading this? You know, we have this massive first mover advantage at Q-Control being, you know, around since 2017 with a team of experts, and we've already gotten involved in all of these things. Plus, you have the first crop of, of uh, the first cohort, if you will, of companies emerging, being driven by the people who built the field from the beginning, right? This is a really unusual opportunity. Uh, understanding not every academic is a, is a good uh, business person, but you have a lot of the right people in the community right now doing this work. Thanks, Mark. And, and I might add to it as well. So uh, if I look at quantum, quantum technologies, it is a field where there is so much opportunity and diversity. There is no clear winners. Um, everyone has a particular thing that they can deliver. And as Mike said, the verticals that they are in are big verticals, which can deliver co companies that grow exponentially. So there's no such thing in computing, quantum computing, there are no clear winners. And to think of quantum computing as one thing is also incorrect. There's lots of versions of quantum computing which execute different applications. So for instance, quantum brilliance, we are about building quantum accelerators. That is different to mainframe quantum computing, which is where IBM and Google are playing. And it's also different to what I call quantum workstations, which is what companies like INQ uh, and AQT are building. So there is no such thing as a clear winner in quantum computing because there's a diversity of types and there's diversity of applications and they're all very large verticals. Uh, and the same is true in the other forms of quantum technology. So as a result, there is this uh, burgeoning opportunity to pick something that will accelerate exponentially in those different types and those different uh, uh, verticals. Yeah, and, and ju just let me just speak to this from an investor's point of view. So we are believers and investors in, in the quantum segment. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that we see that there are these trillion dollar industries that are going to be built. Uh, we want to be early on in that. Um, and when you see that the potential transformation of industry through the use of quantum technologies, that's, that's pretty darned exciting. Now, some people will say, oh, but isn't it too early? And the answer, my answer is no, uh, it's not too early because there are things that are going on right now. So you've heard from Marcus and from Jane and from uh, Mike that uh, they, have, uh, they have 
hardware and software and companies are being created right now that have real customers. And these customers are, they're early customers, but they're being worked with and they're, they're paying customers. So while some of the, you know, the bigger quantum computers might be 10 years away, there's a whole bunch of stuff like quantum sensing, quantum computing, uh, small quantum computers, uh, imaging, all of these things are being worked on and, and there are products for, for these particular areas right now. So let me just give one, uh, one example of, of the potential. So if you take the largest supercomputer in the world and you try to, you try to simulate something like a caffeine molecule, molecule, the largest supercomputer in the world can't simulate it because, you know, and that's a, that's a relatively simple uh, molecule, I think of 24 or 25 atoms. And 24 or 25 is a pretty small number. So why can't the largest supercomputer run for thousands of years and still not be able to simulate it? And, it, and the reason is, is because you have all these, you know, electron to electron interactions, electron to, to proton interactions that you have to simulate. And so it's a very, very big complex problem. And it's something that a classical computer can't do. But a quantum computer, a smallish quantum computer could sort of do that right away. And if you could do that right away, what that means is that at least in the chemistry side of things, you might be able to improve drug development. You might be able to improve chemistry and understand chemistry reactions a lot better. So the potential for revolution of many, many industries is quite large. And that's, that's what gets us excited. And with, with Mike's company, for instance, we saw that he was solving one of the problems that's fundamental as he described it, the Achilles heel. And that is, that is hardware fragility. So if, you're, if he was able to take his software and make these quantum computers run for a longer time and have more compute time, then that's a good thing. Uh, so we, we sort of thought of it as kind of, he was building the picks and shovels for the gold mine here. And Marcus is building a version of the gold mine, uh, a small version that nobody else is building. So these are the kinds of exciting things, at least from our point of view as a deep tech investor that, that get us uh, going in the morning. Uh, so that's, that's my two cents at the moment. Add in a very quick point yep. on, on the investment scene. One of the things that we have discovered is that it, there's an inability to do the due diligence on the tech yeah. by some investors. Um, that's been a problem and, and still is a problem, but it's becoming less so because the one thing now that we're seeing is there's fear of missing out. And with investors coming into quantum, um, you've, prob um, you've probably all heard of the firm Quantination, Paris-based firm. That's the one that is specific, specifically looking for deep physics and quantum. Um, they understand how to do the due diligence, but we are talking to investors that are saying to us, we need to get involved. How do we get involved in this quantum space? So it's beginning to start and it's a really a good thing. Um, the other thing I was just going to add is that when we're dealing with uh, the quantum enabling technology that produces that med tech um, solution, for example, then of course we're not talking to quantum investors, we're talking to med tech investors. So, yeah. and that seems less of a problem for them because they're just looking at a solution that's better for market than anything else that exists at the time. Yeah, great, so, great points. This, great. this investor comment that Jane just made is really interesting and it's led to some very uh, roller coastery dynamics in the sector for the last few years. Um, we saw some outrageous valuations come up for very early companies. Um, and several of them have uh, been cut off at the knees, uh, as it were, as uh, there was a shift from what you could call like a rational exuberance or, or dumb money, people just getting in uh, because they thought they had an opportunity early, but not understanding at all what the timelines were, what the potential impact was, what the revenue model was. Um, some of them got burned and then you know, made a rush for the exit in the last couple of years. And what's left behind is what you can call as you know, a stronger community of both investors who understand the field and understand the time horizons and companies that have strong enough models that they're not just you know, uh, you know, trying to do research in a, in a setting where it's easier to get grants from venture capitalists than it is from the ARC. Um, this this shakeup has actually, I think, been good for the community at the end of the day. But it is so important that everybody understands it from an investor perspective that this is a decadal play. 
right? That some companies like Q Control, we have the ability to make revenue right now on the pathway to the giant uh, uh, discovery of, of, you know, the mother load, if you will, uh, in, in our sector. But getting to the mother load is a decade. Right. And if you if you are an investor who does not have the stomach for that, if your fund has a two year time horizon, then this is not the field for you. Right. And, and I think everybody should be OK saying that it's yeah. really important, fundamental concept. Yeah, we've, we've got a couple of questions which um, love, uh, love to address here. One is um, and there's two separate questions, but I'll sort of combine them into one. One is, um, you know, saying, look, this sort of sounds like, uh, you know, AI of the 80s. And uh, is this sort of a repeat here uh, where, you know, nothing happened for a long time, 35, 40 years later, machine learning is now sort of taking hold. And the other is, look, we've heard this all before. Um, we've heard this all before with microelectronics, but we didn't build an industry. So can you address this? Is this another, is this sort of, an, a, a, of another industry where lots of promise and no action? Or how, how do we sort of how do we sort of tackle this or what, how do we think about this? I think it's about business conditions, right? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the questions uh, said, it's not a question of intellectual capability of Australia, just business acumen. It's not that at all. It is not business acumen. It's about business conditions. It's about whether the government decides to continue subsidizing mining or it decides to, uh, in part at least, support high-tech emerging industries. The valley of death in technology translation is a global phenomenon. It's not just in Australia. It's just that in other domiciles, governments have figured out, out ways to, to help bridge the gap. I mean, there's a, there's a story that, uh, that is, uh, I think, quite salient. You know, Palantir is a Peter Thiel Founders Fund company. It's extremely successful, enormous company data analytics. You know, one can question whether it's on the good or the bad side of things. But their success is based on uh, an enormous contract that they got from the U.S. government, from the CIA. They, the CIA was a customer. Now, I think in Australia, what we don't have is a track record of public sector organizations being customers for early technologies, right? And that's something that fundamentally needs to change. If we want sovereign capability, that means if the military in Australia wants sovereign capability, they need to buy it. Yeah. They can't just wait for you know Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman to deliver it to them in 20 years. They need to buy it as it's being developed with terms that are favorable to the companies that are building it and not uh, you know, gonna kill us in the long term. This is, a, this is a very new thing for Australia, as best I can tell, and it will require work. But if we want it collectively, this can happen. Otherwise, the, the, the point is quite correct. We will all leave, right? If the government cannot do it, if they will not support us, we will go to the markets where we can do it. It's a horrible situation, but that's the reality of a global tech sector. So I might pick up on, on where Mike is going there and say this is with my quantum brilliance hat on uh, and very much agree that um, the, at the current situation in quantum technology, it is, it's, it's about public leadership in order to, in, to create and support an industry to develop that sovereign capability. And we can look, and I, I, I very much invite Jane to talk about this. Um, uh, and that is the United Kingdom have taken a very aggressive stance about sovereign capability uh, and that they um, are putting a great deal of money and effort and, and a very sophisticated thought into how to architect an industry. Well, Jane, at least that's what it appears from here in Australia in the colonies. I'm sure it mightn't be as beautiful back home uh, as, it, as it otherwise is, but the, um, it, it, they're putting a lot of thought into it and they very much believe they want to have a, a quantum supply chain that is wholly within the United Kingdom. If we look at Germany, who have just declared $2 billion investment in quantum technologies and to build a sovereign supply chain of, uh, to develop and to, to sell and to have quantum technologies within Germany. That's another classic example. And, and then the US are doing similar sorts of things. Now, Australia is in this position where it's a middle power and it's a middle economy. It does not have the endless public resources. So it needs to be a little bit uh, more intelligent in how it does this, but nevertheless, it's about being able to commit the, the, the appropriate public funds and also to match that with private funds. So large corporations and these sorts of things who will see dividends from going into a public private type partnership in order to 
uh, be these early adopters, these first customers to grow the industry within Australia and to also allow the Australian industry to access similar sorts of programs in, in other nations. So we have to accept we're a middle, we're a middle, we're a middle, we're a middle economy, uh, but we can still do a similar role, but not at the scale that perhaps the UK, or the Germany, or, or the US can. Jane, I please jump in here and talk about the UK uh, experience. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Um, I think this sort of goes back to what I was saying originally, where there were two calls by Innovate UK that were called the quantum calls, which funded projects which startups could lead, where they got the 70% of the funding towards the project and just needed to find the 30%. Um, I, I actually was in Australia, believe it or not, before I came back to the UK to do QTech. So I was... Um, learning very rapidly what the UK government was doing way back in 2016. Uh, they've since changed in the way that they allocate that money and now it's, it's more focused towards the, the bigger companies leading these projects rather than the startups and it is on building those value chains and the way that works with the startups, in my view, does not as work as well as it did when they had those initial quantum calls, which were able to be used by uh, the startup companies. Um, at the moment, would QTEX funding, as you know, is ending. There is nothing being proposed by the government to replace it. And I think that's a hole that needs to be filled. Um, there's little coming to, in terms of public money to the startup industry at this moment in time. There might be plans for next year. Everybody's distracted by COVID at the moment. Um, but I can't believe they'd let a good thing like QTech go, but they are. Um, so are they upheld as the golden boys? Mm, perhaps not as in such high regard as you hold them, Marcus. <laughs> But perhaps we're doing things better than Australia and things need to be learned there. Yeah, Joe, I, look, I, I appreciate the realities once you're on the other side of the fence, but certainly from here, when I, when I read all the, the policy documents and the action, it seems very good. Uh, but we, we'd certainly like to learn more from, from yourself and, and others who have come from the UK uh, over to Australia to, to, to help us here. Can I, um, can I just jump in with, with a quick comment? I, I, I realize that from the outside, for those people who are coming from maybe a business perspective, um, incumbent industry, perhaps government, that uh, it sounds a little bit like uh, a bunch of academics with their hands out, right? Just through, through a different mechanism. And that is really not what's going on. We are uh, industrialists at this point, right? So, so Marcus and I both run companies. Our companies have customers. But all small technology companies that are in this early start of their scaling journey face this valley. They call it the valley of death, where you have some revenue, but you need to get enough to grow to really big markets. And uh, in successful uh, jurisdictions like Silicon Valley, it is almost always the government that is filling that role as the early customers when it comes to this kind of deep tech. When it's a, like a mobile application to sell wine or something, fine, it could just be business to consumer and it takes off on its own. But when it's deep technology, government as a customer has always been the model that worked. And we would love to see more of that here, uh, trust in the local technology community uh, in order to help support the the really astounding work that's going on here, there are there are fundamentally transformational things that are going on in Marcus's company, in Q Control, uh, in our partnerships, both uh, domestically and around the world, and we want to bring that capability to the government that keeps asking for it. We need the commercial terms that make that work. It is that shrewd and that simple. So, so Mark, I might offer. Uh... A, a tangible example of something that um, we're thinking about here, and, and feel free to jump in and correct me if I if I misrepresent um, the way you're thinking. And this is based upon an example uh, in the United Kingdom, and that is the concept of a uh, a national quantum computing centre. So it is a co-investment between government, defence, and uh, major corporations, who co-invest to create such an entity. And that entity then has several functions. One of it is, is that it accepts emerging technology from Australia. 
uh, and therefore injects cash into supporting the supply chain within Australia to deliver that hardware and software to that uh, National Quantum Computing Centre. So it's not a handout, it's not a funding, it is a contract to deliver things to that National Quantum Computing Centre, which is then a capability for the nation to use. Another part of that is an industrial transformation hub, which is uh, analogous to what Quantum Brilliance is developing with, with Pawsey Supercomputing Centre, which is a cohort or a cadre of uh, quantum application developers who then enable the discovery and development of applications uh, with corporate and business partners. And so the major corporations gain value because they can see applications being discovered and developed that affects their business. And therefore they get a share of the, of the value that that delivers to their business. That cohort is supported by its national institute and it is also supporting a development of national supply chain, which is, de which is delivering hardware into that national quantum computing center. Um, so that could be an example of uh, a publicly uh, uh, co-funded exercise, which is nothing academic about it at all, which is very much about developing an industry in a supply chain and delivering value to the broader industry. I, I think Marcus, that's a, that's a, it, it is actually a very interesting model, the NQCC, with the objective of taking this expertise out of academia and having it being separate as a clearinghouse of, of capability where they're contracting uh, per, uh, you know, contributors to development of that technology. Um, another model is just straight engagement with uh, the emerging companies. I'm very pleased to say, I can't uh, disclose who, but there is a public sector body, uh, a non-science body that is just a, you know, a part of the government in Australia that is a customer of Q controls, that they are working with us to uh, avail themselves of the capabilities we have in making quantum computers perform better for their applications. So that's a, a it's a really new approach, but it, it works well because they get a deliverable. It's not science funding. It's not PDFs of, of technical outputs. It is new software capabilities that serve their needs and make them quantum ready. And we'd love to see more of that as well as a model. I'm going to, I'm going to dive in here. <laughs> um, I think, Bill, we could listen to uh, these wonderful contributors and you all day. And I, I think it bodes well for Tech 23, uh, the state of deep tech, uh, the role of government, all these things. I, I could seriously listen for the next few hours. I want to thank you. Um, and I know there's been children, early starts, dogs, everything um, that you've, uh, you've juggled to uh, contribute today. Um, we are still going to have the opportunity to talk to people who are passionate to stay on the line, but I am aware, especially on the Eastern State, it's nearly time for... Um, for uh, home life to probably you know enter in so you're welcome um, to if you if you can't join us to uh, in the small groups or to, to continue this discussion with our wonderful contributors um, we are sorry to, for you to leave but we hope we'll see you on a circle phil's mentioned the matter events for anyone that's an investor they will be running soon um, small groups so yeah please consider those um, and please join with me in thanking our contributors today. We're going to um, suggest if you want to stay on the line, because I know there's lots of questions, um, we will, we'll in a sec, move you into small groups to talk. And what we suggest there is that you talk challenges, think about what some of the questions have been shared, uh, opportunities for the market, the role of government, role of regulation, all these things. There's lots on the mural boards to kick off discussions with people that have got similar passions. And thank you, Bill, and uh, the contributors for what has been a wonderful conversation to eavesdrop on. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one, one quick thing. So thank you, Rachel, for putting it all together. Um, I, I think you can you can see though through through Jane and Marcus and, and Mike that look here, there, there is a huge opportunity here. And this is a very, very small part of the discussion. Uh, and for me personally, I think this is a chance for Australia to lead the world and be a net producer versus a net consumer. And that's what we're really talking about here. So I'm gonna be really not happy if uh, we become a net consumer of things versus a net producer, because the talent is here, that's embodied in the people on the call. Uh, the research is here, 
the will is here, the ambition is here. Why do we want to become a consumer when we can lead the world and be a producer? Doesn't make any sense to me. So that's why we're so excited about it. And I think we'll break into small rooms now. So thanks everybody. Yeah, look, we'll go on to smaller groups. Anyone who gets lost, just come back to the main group. So Caroline, I think it's gonna move us now. Thank you all very much. And